My mind has been consumed lately with this thought of our world, our culture, our society, you know, even as Americans. Um, and, you know, I've talked to other preachers, other men of God, and just kind of got their pulse on things and to see if I'm, if I'm off base, if, if, or if they're in agreement with me, if they're feeling the same way, and to a man... <laughs> We're all kind of seeing this thing the same way. And it seems like our culture, you know, is, is, is so much, I mean, if, if you go back, you know, 50, 60 years, um, it's a different world, you know. It's a whole different place, a whole different mindset. And so um, I think, you know, maybe as, as God's people, by and large, what we did was we, um, because it's what we saw done when we were young, we kind of just felt like there was one way uh, of, of either serving the Lord, reaching people, etc. And I think as our culture has shifted, um, we have to be, as Jesus told his disciples, wise as serpents but harmless as doves. We need to be thinking um, instead of just relying on the methods and the ways that we've done things in the past, we need to look at this society and realize, number one, this isn't 1950. And what I mean by that is, is that most people are not churched. Most people don't know the Bible. Um, in fact, uh, just to be truthful, a lot of our churches are filled with biblically illiterate people. They know enough, they know the stories, they know the right answers, but if it came down to it, they may not be able to tell you why they believe what they believe. And so for, for, for a long time, I feel like we've been riding this wave of the Christian culture, if you will, from the 50s and 60s, and then um, having the same methods, doing it the same way for so long that there's a world out there who when we say you know, do you admit that you're a sinner? They say, no. 60, 70 years ago, people would have said, yeah, I understand that, by and large. Nowadays, people say, no. What are you calling me a sinner for? Uh, do you go to church? Never crossed my mind. Uh, this is the culture where we find ourselves today. And so I believe that we need to take a different approach. Using, I believe we need to use the Bible, same Bible we've always used. I believe we need to stand firm on the Word of God. But I believe that we need to approach people differently with the truth. Um, when I was a teenager, even, you could knock on a door and have a conversation with somebody, and they understood basic Bible truth. You can't do that nowadays. And so, as I've been thinking about this, I've been thinking about our culture, I thought about, well, is there an example in the Word of God where <clears throat> someone, a, a, a believer, was either thrust into a society or a culture, grew up in a society or a culture, where God was foreign, where the things of God were unknown. And I believe, personally, I believe the best example of that is found in the book of Daniel. Uh, the exiles who were taken from Judea, from Jerusalem, to Babylon as young men, some believe around 14 years old, and lived there for another 70 years. And they were immersed in a culture that did not know their God at all, did not appreciate their God. In fact, for the most part, uh, they even changed their Hebrew names to Chaldean names. So they, wouldn't, so they would have less remembrance of where they came from. This was a culture that was anti-God. And so, beginning on Sunday night, we're going to go into the book of Daniel, and we're going to go through it line by line, because I believe he and, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are a picture of how to live in a culture that is completely foreign to our God. 
And that's where we're going. But in that mindset, in that vein, in that thought, um, I started thinking about, well, what kind of questions are people asking today? Skeptics, atheists, agnostics, those who don't know for sure there's a God. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. Atheists who would say, well, there's definitely not a God. Religious people who question everything in the Word of God, and they make up their own religion as they go. What are they asking? What do they think? What are they saying? And so on Wednesday night for the next couple of weeks, however long the Lord leads, we're going to do a series called Questions People Ask. And tonight, here's the question we're going to look at. How did we get here, meaning on earth, how did we get here and why are we here? As human beings, how did we get here and why are we here? Now, if you've grown up in church, you know the right answers. God, God created it, and we're here for a purpose. That's correct. That's not wrong. But when we tell them, well, the Bible says God did this, and here's why, and, and, um, and uh, God did, God, there's a purpose. Your life has a purpose. Well, that sounds just like whatever they're hearing on television or the movies. What we have is the truth. There is one truth. And it comes right out of the Word of God. God's Word is truth. This is truth. If we want to know what God wants, how He designed us, why He designed us, there's only one place to look. And it's to the book that He gave us, that He inspired, and that He has preserved. And while there may be skeptics of the Bible, we cannot be skeptical of the Bible. We have to stand firm on what the Word of God says, and we have to be absolutely convinced that it's true. And in order to do that, we have to know it. So how did we get here, and why are we here? I don't have a lot of science tonight to back us up. I'm going from the, the aspect of give it, building our faith and confidence in what God said, because that's what's truth. Um, this is important to know because we have, we're in a society of people that, take, do, that do not take for granted that God is the creator. We have to know what to tell them. Genesis 1, and we're going to read several verses. We're going to kind of skip through the chapter. So don't turn it off. In fact, get into the word with me. Genesis chapter 1, we'll start in verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And we can all say, Amen. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. That means it had no shape. There was nothing, uh, there was no shape or, or, or form to it. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So right in the first two verses, we have God the Father, and the Spirit of God mentioned in the first two verses of the Bible. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Verse 3, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. Don't pass up the fact that it said, And God said. That's all it took. God spoke. And it happened. Skip down to verse 6. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. An atmosphere. God said it, and it happened. Verse 9, And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God said it, and those things happened as he said they would. And that verse right there, if you know anything about, if you paid attention in geography <laughs> at all, uh, Pangea, right? You had the, at one time, there was one large continent on the earth. That's why the waters were gathered to one place. And then you had one large continent, one large land. If you've ever taken the continents apart, you can fit them together like a puzzle. I believe that all happened um, during the great earthquake in, in, in the book of Genesis. It all separated out. But God spoke it. Verse 11. 
And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, let the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after its kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. It happened. Verse 14, and God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Don't miss that. There are lights in the firmament to divide day and night. We call them the sun and the moon and the stars, right? And God said that they're there for signs. And he said they're there for seasons and for days and years. That's how we tell time. Verse 20, And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth and the open firmament of heaven. God spoke these things into, his, into existence. And then finally, verses 26 and 27, And God said, Let us, evidence of the Trinity, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. God spoke creation, and it was so. Simple and true. And skeptics would say, I don't believe that. And that's their right to not believe it. But friend, don't think they don't have faith. They have faith that's just misplaced. It's misplaced in a random act of the universe. Let me ask you a question tonight. I'd like some feedback. As we think about God's creation, what is most intriguing to you? Of all of God's creation, what intrigues you the most? What fascinates you about God's creation? Donnie. Sunrise and sunset. Sunrise and sunset. It's something to behold, isn't it? Every day. It's beautiful. All the colors, the warmth that it brings, the coolness that it brings at night. Intriguing. Yes, ma'am. The beauty of the variety, the Yeah. I wrote that down. The beauty of the variety of what God has created. And she said the color. I wrote that down too. The different colors in this world. I mean, if you just ever looked at the, the cloudless sky and looked at how beautiful that color is, I know Chris is excited right now because he thinks that God painted the sky the same color as North Carolina Tar Heels, but that's, that's neither here nor there. But, uh, but isn't, it, isn't the sky a beautiful thing, the color? And then, you, then your eyes drag down and you see the green in the trees and the grass. And you see the white snow on the top of a mountain. And you see the, the, the rivers and, and just the color. And when we were in Costa Rica, we got to see one of those little poison dart frogs, you know. You can't make up that color of green. That is a brilliant green that God created that little frog to have. That, and its eyes are as red as red can be. God did that. That's beautiful. The variety and the color, that's intriguing. What else intrigues you about God's creation? But well, Tom. The lo- yeah. Yeah. Last count. Now, nah, last count, there's 16, uh, no, two with 16 zeros after it. Stars that they know of. A lot of stars. And he just said, I'm going to put lights in the firmament. And that many stars that we know of. <laughs> just like that. Justin. What's that? Rain. 
the weather, right? Rain, snow. Yeah, I think it's funny that we still can't figure out how to stop that stuff. <laughs> Anybody ever figures out how to stop the rain? They'll, they'll make a lot of money, but but Don. The intricacies of the human body, the design, how everything works together. Everything has a purpose. And uh, like he said, that just doesn't happen with a boom in the sky. <laughs> there is a designer who made every one of those things to work perfectly when he created man. And by the way, he's the sustainer of our life as well. Yeah, the intricacy of the human body. Unbelievable. Anybody else? One more. Angie. Um, the instincts that we have, both human beings and animals, we don't seem to be able to find. We intentionally don't do it. Yeah. Like, a mother allows two parents or babies. When you get a little girl, they eat it all. You know, even if it's two rocks, but it's going to pot or two that. Mm -hmm. We intentionally do that. That's so cool. Just the instincts. Both uh, humans and with animals. Just they know what, we know what to do with things. That God just gave us that innate ability just to know. And again, that has to come from a designer. <laughs> it doesn't just happen. It, and when you, when you talk about it like this and when you think about it like this, you see, and I don't mean this angry or nasty, you see just how foolish it is to believe in a, in a random act of mass colliding in space. It's just foolish. Thank God for his creation. Well, let me ask you this, and I think I know the answer in this room, but let's talk about it. When you think of, of the wonders of the universe, right, all the things we just talked about, does it increase your faith in God, or does it increase your doubt that God is a creator? And why? Because some people who don't share our biblical worldview they look at the things of the earth and they say, this makes me see there is no God. Because they'll say the Ice Age carved out all the mountains and, 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 and the flood, well, it was a local flood. It wasn't a, a global flood. And they'll have all these skewed reasons. And carbon dating, because of carbon, we can tell that this shell is 14 billion years old. Who says? Who is in control of that? Who said that that carbon dating is right? Who's the judge? No one. That's their best guess. So does creation increase our faith in God, or does it increase our doubts in a God? Right. It does take more faith to believe that something just randomly happened in the universe. Design should increase our faith. It should help us to look around and see Wow, there has to be a designer. There has to be a creator. The Bible is clear that God created everything and everyone in the universe. But what about the people that don't believe the Bible? Further, why does it matter what we believe about the origins of the universe? Why does that even matter? Why do we have to believe one way or the other? And I believe this is why. Brother Jerry. First four words, in the beginning, God. That's why it matters. And consequently, what we believe about the origin of the universe also, by default, is what we believe about humanity. Because if this universe was a random act then humanity was a random act and there is no purpose, there is no design and I can be better than you, you could be better than me and it comes down to this thought of 
survival of the fittest. If everything is random and that matter always existed and it was eternal and one day then an explosion happened and random things came to be, the earth, tadpoles, frogs, monkeys, people, if that's how it was, then your life is not valuable because it was random. It just happened. And I don't know how people marry who would say, uh, there is no God. God cannot be a designer. This randomly happened. But life matters and we need to protect life. Where did they get their morality? Why does life matter if it's random? Where did they get their morality? What God gave us all. Deep inside the soul of every human being, there is some kind of consciousness that there is a God in the universe. In the universe. There, that there is a God who created everything. That's not my words. That's the words of the Bible. Go to Romans chapter 1. That's not a theory. That's not preacher talk. It's straight out of the Word of God. Romans chapter 1 will sum up a lot of things for us. And we'll begin in a familiar place, verse number 20. Romans 1, 20. <clears throat> Listen to how beautifully this is worded. Romans 1, 20 says, For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. That's strong right there. That is a very bold statement out of the Word of God because what God is saying right there is is that everything around us points towards a God and He can be clearly seen the invisible God can be clearly seen by His creation. Even His eternal power and Godhead. What does that mean? His power in creation and the fact that He is God, He is divine, He is superior, He is sovereign. All of that can be seen in His creation. And the Bible says, God says, they are without excuse. They know. So how do they go from this innate gift from God that when a human being looks at creation and says, there has to be something, someone bigger than me that made all of this. How can someone go from that, that innate thing that God gave them, to I do not believe there's a God? Here's how. The rest of this chapter tells us exactly how. Verse 21. Because that, when they knew God, do you see that? All mankind, when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful. But, now here's some key words we're going to have to underline in our Bibles if we're going to understand our culture today. First word is that word became. But became. They weren't created that way. They became vain in their imaginations. And their foolish heart was darkened. They were created with a knowledge, an innate knowledge that as they look at creation, there is something bigger than me. There has to be a God, there has to be a creator. But they became vain. They became vain in their imaginations. That word vain, think about it like this. In their imaginations, they dethroned God. In their heart and in their mind, they took God off the throne and said, I don't believe. It's a choice. Became. They became vain. Verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. They're looking at something that is clear. God said it's clear. And they look at something clear and say, that's unclear. That's how foolish it is. 
They became that way. And look at verse 23. Here's the next word we need to underline. And changed. You see that? They weren't made that way. They changed. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into what? Into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. What does that mean? They took everything around them and made it a God. Instead of worshiping God, they drug him off his throne and made him like a man. And now they worship man, they worship animals, they worship idols, they worship things. Why? Because it makes them God. They took him off the throne and they placed themselves on it. Because if there's a God to answer to, they're no longer in charge. They became vain. They changed. Verse 24. Now watch this. Wherefore, God also gave them up. Note that. God gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Now we're starting to slip into the mindset of our culture today with uh, a person's gender or sex and the way that we behave toward one another physically. How did that happen? God gave them up. God confirmed the hardness of their hearts. He confirmed the pride in their heart. He allowed them to go there. He gave them up to the uncleanness through the lust, notice that, of their own hearts. God did not put the lust in their heart. The lust was in their own hearts, and God confirmed it. Okay? If that's what you want, have it. Don't we recall that the book of Psalms tells us that the children of Israel, remember, lusted. And God gave them what they wanted, but what does it say? He sent leanness to their soul. And we need to be careful, brothers and sisters, because we're not immune as Christians to wanting and lusting and coveting something so badly that we throw God out the window, and sooner or later he's going to say, okay. But you also get the consequences that comes with that. And that's what he's done to the people in this world who will say with a fist in his face, I will not. I will not let you be God. Verse 25, here's the word again. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forevermore, amen. They changed the truth of God into, there's that word again. They changed it. Verse 26, for this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did, what's the word? Change the natural use into that which is against nature. Aren't we seeing that? And likewise also the men, what's the word? What is it? Leaving. They left. They made a decision to walk away from what they know is right. Leaving the natural use of the woman. Burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense or due penalty for their error which was meat. It's their due penalty. Their error for leaving what they know is nat natural, walking away from what is natural, turning to unseemly things, and there is a due penalty for those types of things. Verse 28, and even as, notice this, they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. <laughs> they just said, we're going to put God out of our minds. We're going to turn a blind eye to him or anything about him. We're going to act like he doesn't exist. And what happens? God gave them over to a reprobate or depraved mind to do those things which are not convenient or proper. if that's what you want. But there are consequences. 
Verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness. Listen, filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness. That means they uh, want to cause harm to others. Full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity. That's aggressive maliciousness and whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things. Aren't we seeing that? Disobedient to parents without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, meaning they're unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. And this is exactly what we are seeing in our society. Well, wait a minute. If Paul wrote about this all the way back then, wasn't it happening then? Yes, it was. Was it glorified back then? Yes, it was. And what's happening in our culture today is it is being glorified, magnified, and shown as the normal in the name of what they call tolerance. That's not the true definition of tolerance. This is what we see happening. So we understand from Scripture <clears throat> that people who are unbelievers, agnostics, atheistic, choose to walk away from God, choose to rebel from God, have pride in their heart, have made a choice. They've changed. They've left. We've seen those words over and over. I'll comment on this and then have a final scripture and we'll be finished. I'm appalled at how far we've gone when doctors are now asking children in the doctor's office, are you a boy or a girl? That's happening. Parents, when you go in there with your child, listen carefully to the questions your ch children are being asked. Are you a boy or a girl? You know what I find interesting about that? This is going to seem weird to you, but listen. I was watching Shark Week a couple weeks ago on Discovery Channel. And they'd, uh, they'd drop a camera down in the water. They'd get in a cage. Here'd come a shark. You know what they'd say? It's a male or it's a female. Pray tell, how did they know that? Did they ask the shark? I know what you look like. I know what your God-given body looks like. But, are you a boy or a girl? Now, these are the same scientists who would stand up and say, you need to let people choose. But we can look at an animal. <laughs> Scientists can look at an animal and say, it's a boy, it's a male or a female. But then they'll get in a room with a human and say, now, what are you? I want to know how you feel. And I'm not making light of the situation. I'm saying this to show how absolutely absurd that this is. And while it does make us a little angry, let me say, that an angry response from us is not going to change a thing. We, as God's people, have to live as we have been designed. And we have to live as he has outlined in this word. Because let me tell you something. They're stopping listening to what we have to say. And they're starting to watch how we live. And when they do not match, see, there's no God. Even his people don't do what he tells them to do. Why should I believe? They're not listening to this anymore. They're watching what I do now. That doesn't mean that I kowtow and bow down to all of their idols and all of their ways of life, and I agree with them in everything they do. But that means that I am like Jesus would be and like the fruit of the Spirit is, gentleness, love, peace, 
temperance, faith, the fruit of the Spirit. Jesus on earth, the light of the world. That is who we are. And while we should talk, while we should engage in discussion, while we should be able to explain why we believe what we believe, we better live what we believe. Because right now, they're not listening. They're just watching. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time together in your word. And Father, as we, our hearts break as we consider our society and our culture and how it seems just to be going crazy as to what we know to be the truth, I pray that you would help us to, first of all, not to be angry with them. They're deceived. Lord, that we wouldn't be angry with them, but that we'd have a compassion on them because if it wasn't for your grace, dear God, that would be me. So please help us to exhibit grace and love and compassion and gentleness and kindness and meekness and temperance. Help us. Help us to know why we believe in it, but help us to live what you command us to live. God, use us, please, for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray.